We'll call the Senate Labor and Industry Policy Committee to order. Today is Wednesday, February 23rd. It is 8.30. We have three bills on the agenda today. Um, we are going to start with Senate File 295, um, and we'll, I will make a motion that uh, we refer uh, Senate File 295 to the State Government Committee. Uh, Senator Dreheim, to your bill. Thank you, uh, Chair Rarick and, and members. Uh, today we have a, uh, a bill that would move um, radon rulemaking from um, Department of Health to uh, labor and industry. And kind of my thought, there's been a lot of debate on, on radon licensing to begin with. And, and that's a whole different argument. If we're gonna do this, let's do it right. And, and when we look at the landscape of where our construction licensure um, is handled, it's the Department of Labor and Industry. And I, I think for cohesiveness, it would be best suited to have it with the rest of the codes and uh, licensing. Um, which for the primary part, um, the oversight for construction is the Department of Labor and Industry. So that, that's kind of the, the quick and dirty description of what I'm attempting to do. And I would like to go to the testifiers and then I can circle back if I could, Chair. Very good, Senator Dreheim. We will, uh, our first testifier up will be Nick Erickson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, uh, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Nick Erickson, the Director of Research and Regulatory Affairs for Housing First Minnesota, uh, and I'm here today to speak in favor of Senator Dreheim's bill. Uh, you know, comprehensive housing policy reform uh, re challenges rethinking our existing policies and challenging the status quo. And Senator Dreheim's been at the forefront of this movement in Minnesota since joining the Senate. He's on the state was on the state's task force on housing. He's on the Legislative Commission on Housing Affordability, and he chairs the Senate's Housing Committee and someone that I've been working with closely for years on legislation such as this. You know, today, building a home in Minnesota involves interactions with uh, no fewer than 10 uh, state agents or local and state agencies, um, and in some cases, federal entities, and many of which require their own individual permitting and reviews. And this bill seeks to streamline the process by removing one stop in that uh, um, you know, process. When you examine the existing state statute as well as the proposed legislation, uh, Senate File 295 does make sense. Radon mitigation firms are essentially contractors, building contractors. And as Senator Dreheim noted, uh, building regulations, building contractors, that falls under the Department of Labor and Industries purview. Further, there, these firms often employ subcontractors, and if you're talking about doing a mitigation program in an existing home, it's not just the radon work, it also will involve some uh, demolition and repair to you know, get the house back uh, to normal. And you know, all of that, the contractor-subcontractor relationship already falls under uh, Minnesota Department of Labor and Industry. Uh, there's also a, an exemption in some of the radon um, testing requirements right now, and that actually is for building officials who do not need to be licensed to do uh, radon testing. Building officials, of course, already fall under the Department of Labor and Industry. And, you know, we're looking at, you know, what's being done within the state to kind of streamline our housing, process, housing policies and, and moving uh, construction regulations to DLI uh, this would not be the first. You know, we've done it with the uh, commercial and residential energy codes, which previously have been part of the Department of Commerce. On the stormwater side, uh, Bowser and a few other state agencies are currently working with the Army Corps of Engineers to take a federal program and uh, several individual state programs and merge them all under one existing program to be managed by the state. You know, that program is not just about streamlining government, it's also about better, more efficient uh, systems in the, in a, as, as an outcome. Um, and I'll just close with this. I just wanted to be brief today. Uh, I work with a lot of state agencies on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, whenever I interact with an agency other than the Department of Labor and Industry, I tell that agency that DLI is the guidepost to how all state agencies should be interacting with stakeholders and interested parties. Uh, never once have uh, we been have we struggled to get an answer from DLI. They're fair, 
transparent and open with all stakeholders and um, be happy to have uh, this program move to their uh, oversight and I can stand for any questions um, after testifiers if you'd like Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, yes, members, we'll get through our testifiers and then we'll go back to have questions following that. So our next testifier is uh, Mr. Dan Huff from the Minnesota Department of Health. Good morning, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Dan Huff. I'm an assistant commissioner with the Minnesota Department of Health. Uh, and I would like to speak to you today um, about uh, this uh, Senate file 295. Um, first of all, a little history. Um, radon is in, in background. Radon, uh, it's a colorless, odorless, radioactive gas that leaks into homes from the soil. It is the second leading cause of lung cancer after smoking in America. MDH is responsible for environmental health hazard regulations. The state radon program has been managed by MDH for over 30 years. Radon standards are detailed, they're complex. So we employ scientists with specialized radon expertise who have received extensive training in radon measurement and mitigation uh, that are funded by the radon licensing fees. Under Minnesota's Radon Licensing Act, MDH licenses radon measurement professionals radon mitigation professionals, and laboratories conducting radon analysis. This uh, act was, uh, the Radon Licensure Act, was enacted by the legislature seven years ago in 2015. MDH completed rulemaking in fall of 2018, and most licensure requirements started January 1st of 2019 with residential mitigation licensure starting on June 1st of 2020. So MDH has been issuing licenses and tags and collecting fees to pay for the program. Currently, there are about 450 licensed radon professionals through MDH. MDH has worked closely with contractors, including providing educational and technical assistance over these years. Now, by moving to another agency, rulemaking would have to start over. Rulemaking is not a fast process. It could take years for DLI to adopt new rules. And consumers would lack protections in that meantime. Uh, the rules developed by DLI may ultimately mirror current MDH rules, but that would be costly to both the state and the fee payers to transfer and uh, basically start this whole process over again. If DL took out over radon regulation, it would then fall to hundreds of local building officials, adding an additional burden along with their many other responsibilities, which would also lead to a lack of consistency enforcement of this public health issue. Um, Therefore, MDH uh, opposes this move. We feel that it is, uh, uh, one, it, it loses all the work that we have uh, invested over the last seven years. Um, it will be costly to the ratepayer, um, and it will cause additional and further delay in uh, enacting these rules that are determined and made to protect public health. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next testifier is Mr. Charlie Durenberger with the Department of Labor and Industry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, members. My name is Charlie Durenberger. I'm an assistant director at the Department of Labor and Industries Construction Codes and Licensing Division. I manage our licensing and enforcement units. And uh, basically, I'd just like to mirror what Mr. Huff just said. Uh, our department's position is uh, that the Department of Health has the expertise and the personnel and the uh, experience to effectively manage this radon program. And uh, we believe that uh, it would just be a, in the best interest of the public to keep uh, that program at the Department of Health. Uh, though we do <laughs> certainly appreciate uh, all the efforts of, of Senator Dreheim and, and, and Nick's comments as well uh, about our efforts. Uh, we just think that uh, this program is better off uh, uh, with the Department of Health. Uh, thank you, Mr. Durenberger. And I have, is there anyone else who wishes to testify um, on 
the bill that uh, was not on the list. I am not seeing anyone here. Uh, Senator Dreheim, did you want to respond to anything before we go to questions? I, I would like to, Chair, and, and um, you know, members, the, the radon requirements are in code. They are part of the building code for new construction. Um, in the construction process, we have a lot of things that have to do with safety. Carbon monoxide, how a furnace is plumbed, the, the intake and the, the exhaust, how that's done, how your hot water heater, if it's a gas hot water heater, how that's vented. Um, and we also have radon. Um, I, I think it's pretty naive to think that MDH is the only one that could do this. And, and I hope that there is that play in between our state agencies where they would work together to transition this. Um, I, I, I printed off um, from the Dolly website, um, kind of the it's a, uh, construction codes and licensing. If I could, Chair, just read just a couple sentences. The Construction Code and License Division provides for regulation and enforcement of construction-related health and safety codes and licensing law and new and existing structures. Okay, that's right off their website. Now, members, what I'm trying to do here, I think, fits that to a T. Um, radon is something that has been um, addressed in the whole transaction of real estate. Um, the, the realtors have it in every form. If you've bought or sold a house, you've, you've noticed how it's on all the forms, uh, all the disclosures. It's in construction code. So I, and, and I think a lot more people die for carbon monoxide poisoning than radon. Um, not that radon isn't important, we should mitigate it, but I think this is just better for the whole construction trade and, and for the people of Minnesota. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Dreheim. And I have a few questions to start with. And um, I would begin with uh, Mr. Dernberger. Um, it was mentioned that uh, we'd have to start over. Is there any reason that the Department of Labor would not be able to adopt the current standards immediately and start reviewing them and make changes as needed? Um, why would we have to believe that you would need to start over from scratch? Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, my understanding is that the rulemaking, uh, we, we basically are being given rulemaking authority, uh, and it's my understanding that we would have to then engage in that rulemaking. Um, and during the rulemaking process, uh, we're not able to just continue to, to uh, uh, manage the program that MDH has right now. So I'm going to follow up with that. Uh, the question would be, why would you not be able to just immediately adopt their standards and then start reviewing them and make changes according to what you might find if changes were needed? Mr. Chairman, my understanding is that that would all be a result of the formal rulemaking process, that we can't just skip, basically skip the rulemaking process and, and unilaterally decide that uh, MDH's standards are, are acceptable, even though uh, they're based on national standards, as I understand it. Uh, I don't know that we would, uh, the, the end result of the of a new rulemaking process would come up with anything different, but it's my understanding, uh, and I'm not an attorney, I, I'm not that familiar with the rulemaking process myself, but that's what I've been told, is that we would have to basically start from scratch with an entire new rule uh, and go through that entire process, which Mr. Huff indicated will take, year, could take years. Well, I, one quick comment. I think that's what drives most Minnesotans nuts when we hear answers like that, when common sense tells you you could pick it up right where it's at and start making changes. And that's an answer that I can't stand hearing from our agencies. Um, another, I mean, Mr. Huff, you made a comment that this would be a burden on building officials and that you need to do the work. Aren't the building officials already involved with building and construction and they're on site and you're actually the ones that are coming on site with nothing else to do and that the burden is actually on you to have to be there when you wouldn't be for anything else? Mr. Chair, um, the uh, um, difference here is on new construction 
versus uh, mitigation. So the uh, building officials um, inspect per the building code for new construction. Um, and uh, uh, this is really about mitigation of radon systems, which is very different than radon uh, systems that are added as part of new construction. Uh, um, it is similar to many of our other environmental health regulatory authority, uh, lead hazards, uh, for example. Um, and it is because of the, um, the nature of the diagnostic testing, um, it is a complicated system. Um, and which is why MDH licenses not only the uh, measuring specialist, but the contractor, as well as the laboratories performing the analysis. Thank you. And Mr. Huff, can you let us know how many other types of construction contractors that the Department of Health licenses? Uh, Mr. Chair, I'll have to get back to you on that. I know we have a number of licenses, uh, licensed professionals um, specific to contractors. I know we do have our um, uh, folks who are uh, licensed lead mitigation or mediation professionals, but I'll have to get back to you on what other professionals that we license specifically in contracting. All right. I probably will have a few more, but I will go to uh, Senator McEwen next. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, I have a few questions. I'm not sure necessarily who um, this would go to best, but what I'm hearing is, and it, and it makes a lot of sense to me, and, and first off, let me say thank you to the testifiers today, and thank you very much um, to the Minnesota Department of Health and the Minnesota Department of Labor and Industry for all of the fine work that you do on behalf of the people of Minnesota. Um, it's, it's just so critical and so important, and your expertise is, is valued so much. So thank you very much today for coming and for sharing your expertise with us around this issue. Um, I'm hearing that, and something that makes sense to me, which is that we're talking about two very different function, functions. Excuse me, I'm, I have a cold right now, so I'm struggling a little bit with my voice. But um, I'm hearing two different functions. I'm hearing, on the one hand, the public health aspect of this and the need for ongoing regulation. And on the other, I'm hearing about um, safety and installation, which is also a very important issue as well. Um, and we want to, as I understand it with this bill, transfer all of those functions over to uh, the Department of Labor and Industry. Um, I'm, <laughs> I have a few questions here. Um, what I'm wondering is perhaps, um, Senator Dreheim, um, what I'm hearing is that there is going to be a stop if we were to do this. If this were to happen, there would be a gap period. So wouldn't this put people at risk where we don't have an agency covering this for that period of time? Senator and I have Dre more, another follow-up to yeah. it. Thank you. Senator Thank Dreheim. You. Thank you, Senator McEwen, for the question. Um, I, I don't think there would be a stop. So. And, and so to the question about safety, right now it's in construction codes. So if you build any new construction, you should have a passive radon mitigation system in. And for those who don't understand what a system is, they put it below the uh, slab. They put a, a pipe, they seal up the whole floor, they put a pipe, and they vent it up above the roof line. In most cases, it has to be above the roof line. Um, they put an outlet in the attic where you can plug in and put in a fan to suck the air out of underneath the slab and pump the, the gas out up into the atmosphere. So that's what the system is. So the code states you have to put a passive system in when you build. As far as the mitigation for existing structures that are older than 2005 or whenever it was we, we put this in the code, um, most communities have a building permit process. So if you do any project in your home, 
um, usually other than paint and flooring, you got to get a building permit. And I hope that our local building inspector, inspectors are following through on that inspection if there's a radon mitigation put in. Uh, and that's up to the local communities to decide. Um, but I, I really haven't seen any mitigation systems installed that weren't retested. That is part of the common procedure when they put in a mitigation system. They test before, they test after. Um, the only thing complicated about the system is the testing machine. The, the system itself is, is pretty simple. Um, so I, I don't think that's very complicated. So I hope that answered your question. So I don't think there would be a gap in safety as, as, at all. Thank you, Senator Dreheim. Senator McEwen, follow up. Yes, please. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Dreheim. I appreciate that. I'm, I'm just wondering, though, um, with that installation, you said that it, your your understanding is that it's a common practice to do a testing um, as part of that installation. Is that what you're saying? Correct, Senator. If that's okay, Chair. Sorry, Mr. Chair. I should ask. Yeah, and Senator McEwen again, follow up or. Yes, please. Yes, please. Um, and and but there's no ongoing testing after that. Like so, what I, I guess what I'm wondering, and and perhaps I should I should direct my question to the Department of Labor and Industry, who is here as well. Um, do, does does DLI have any experience right now with testing for radon or using the the equipment for doing that testing? Mr. Durenberger. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Senator McEwen, no, we don't. We uh, we do inspections of state uh, projects like prisons and hospitals and uh, schools and that sort of thing, but uh, we don't have any background in uh, radon measurement, radon testing, uh, and we our inspectors don't go into residential homes except uh, for our electrical inspectors. Thank you. So, um, and Senator McEwen, if I can address that a little bit, though, uh, it is not the department of health that does the testing. There are contractors that do the testing. They are licensed by the Department of Health right now, and we are saying, this bill is saying they should be licensed by the Department of Labor. So the departments and the agencies are not the ones doing the testing. Senator McEwen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, for my follow-up, I, I, I understand I, one of the other things that I heard in the testimony today is that this is this has really been settled for a, a number of years, that this type of testing has been handled through our public health apparatus, through the Minnesota Department of Health for years and years. And in fact, that there has been also some litigation, I understand, um, to back this up. So both in our statutory framework and in the case law framework, this is, is settled, that these are the roles that these different um, government um, functions play in the way that they, they do this. My question is, is perhaps for DLI, DLI and also um, for the Minnesota Department of Health. My concern is if, if this rulemaking has to start over, and I understand um, what Mr. Chair is saying is that there are contractors who are actually on the ground doing this testing, but nevertheless to switch the entire expertise over to a different government agency. If that has to happen and we do have a gap in that regulatory um, application, and, and we don't actually have people looking this over, another thing that I'm worried about is the litigation piece. Do you, do you foresee that there could be increased litigation, like working out um, how uh, this new framework? Uh, Mr. Durenberger or Mr. Huff, whichever one wishes to answer. Mr. Chairman, I'll, I'll take the first crack at that one. I, the, the issue really is that we need to have rules in order to guide us in how we implement and, and administer a, a new licensing program. And the bill, as it's written, specifically deletes out the MDH rules, which leaves us with nothing. There are no rules. And, and without rules, the Department of Labor and Industry could be opened up to a lawsuit based on, on whatever we end up doing with this program, we could be accused of unpromulgated rulemaking would be the, would be the concern that we would have. Mr. Huff, do you wish to add anything? Chair, if I could, after he said. 
Um, thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator. Um, as my colleague at DLA said, um, rulemaking um, has to occur before we can implement uh, statute as passed by, uh, by you. Um, and this is, uh, we have to follow Chapter 14, um, Administrative Procedures, um, which it outlines in statute how rulemaking occurs. So I know all of us in, in the executive branch would love to speed up uh, rulemaking. However, um, the, the process is actually outlined in statute. Uh, I'll have a quick follow-up on that one then. So if this were amended to say that the, the department were to take on the current rules and then make adjustments, would that alleviate all issues that you see? Um, our our uh, staff here has a question, Ms. Fontaine. Yes, um, Mr. Chair. Is it, is it still echoing? We can hear you online. Let's meet yourself on the Chair members, so my understanding from, I consulted with uh, Stephanie James, who's counsel the state government, and this bill has been around and you know different versions and different things that um, have wanted to be done with this with, with radon in general. And I've consulted with, with her in the past about rules and rulemaking, and you know this would have to go to state government just because of transferring of any duties between agencies that would need to go for that, also the rulemaking piece. Um, but there is, in Chapter 15, um, it, it does provide for uh, when, when rulemaking is transferred that, that the rules that are currently in place, this is uh, 15.039 subdivision so 3, when you transfer powers among agencies, the rules in place under the first agency remain effective and are in enforceable by the agency to which the first agency's responsibilities are transferred. So my understanding, and maybe, I, and I consulted with Stephanie James, was that those would remain in place and are enforceable by the agency that they're being transferred to. So I understand that uh, there may be some changes that need to take place, but they don't go away and they are enforceable by that agency to which the duties are transferred. So a state government will need to discuss this further, but that is my understanding. Thank you very much for that clarification. Uh, Senator Dreheim. Thank you, Chair. And, and I know you have other bills up today, so I, I won't take up too much time. But I, I guess I would ask that uh, the... Mr. Chair? Yep. Senator Isaacson, you're next. Oh, okay. Just want to make sure I wasn't missed. Thank you. Oh, yep. Sorry, 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 Senator Dreheim. Nope, no problem. Thank you, Chair and, and Senator Isaacson. I, I guess, like was mentioned, we've had discussions about radon for years. And um, should we license them, should we not? And what are the fees being used for has been asked before. And today is the first time I heard that the Department of Health has scientists devoted to radon. So what I'm asking the department to provide us is who is assigned to radon and when were they hired? Because this is the first I've heard of it. What we use are the federal guidelines for radon. That is the standard that we've used here in Minnesota for 20 years. We use the, the federal guidelines for radon. Um, so this is the first I heard of it. I, I appreciate the testimony from the agencies. I do believe this is the right move. Uh, it is no different than any other aspect of construction. We have to rely on our good people in the trades to do their job. 
And, and this is no different than any other aspect of, of building our homes. Right. Senator Isaacson. Thank you. So my question is this, Mr. Chair, and maybe Senator Graham can catch this. I must have missed the very um, end of, or beginning of what was said. I understand the argument we're having about the, the, pro the rulemaking and the process, but I want to know is, just from Senator Drahan, if we can, why? Like, I get that we could, uh, I just don't know why. And I, I'm not sure I understand what was the reasoning behind why we want to change this over. And if you could, if you said that before, I apologize if I missed it earlier, but if you could just give me a, a brief over of that, and then I have a second question, Mr. Chair. Senator Drahan. Go Bison. Um, Sorry, Senator Isaacson. Um, You're good. Thanks. Uh, you know, all of our building code, the purview of Department of Labor Industry is to work with the construction trade. Um, MDH just started a couple years ago with the licensing. Um, I, I believe it was done in 2020, right? If, if, if I'm correct. Um, so there is a fee being charged to people being licensed. And I believe this is the real reason why MDH doesn't want that to go to Department of Labor and Industry, it is the money piece, not because it's the safety of the people. Um, I think this is just good governance. Why have other agencies do you doing? the construction? Keep it all in one. It's easier for the industry and it's cohesive. And it just makes sense. Senator Isaacson, follow up. Well, I think that he kind of answered both my questions. And so what I'd say is that um, while I'm not an expert on radon and MDH, I feel like I've gained a little bit of understanding in my 10 years here of how government works. And I'm not sure that I necessarily appreciate Senator Dreheim's characterization that MDH is doing this as a money grab. So I think that's a little less than genuine that way. I, I do think that if there's a way this has worked and both agencies are telling us this is not a good idea, that's a pretty strong indication that maybe we need to rethink this. And so I'm not comfortable with the bill as it is right now. I'd have to do more research and talk to the, to, to the agencies and figure out what's happening because I don't think I necessarily have heard a reason and why we would make a change that that's not, that's not clear, right? So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, I'm gonna ask first for clarification, Mr. Chair, where is this bill going next? Uh, Senator Isaacson, this is going to state government. Okay, then I'm going to go ahead and ask for a roll call on this vote and, uh, and hope that some of this stuff can get cleared up in state government before it goes any other, it goes any further, unless we can indeed find a reason that we should be making this change. Uh, so thank you. Yep. A roll call has been requested. A roll call will be granted. Uh, Senator Goggin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> I guess I'm going to direct this to the uh, <clears throat> departments. When MDH uh, put the rulemaking together in their radon licensing program, uh, did you utilize the national standards uh, when creating that rulemaking? Mr. Huff. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, Senator. Um, yes, the, the national standards are what is the level of radon that is acceptable. Um, and then uh, what we did is we looked at, uh, um, and the standards that we then enforce is our licensees who are performing the, the measurement following those national standards and best practices um, are the contractors bringing the radon down to a level below, which is uh, four micrograms uh, per liter of air. That's the national standard. You know, the, the original intent and the reason for this legislation is um, contractors were installing radon mitigation systems, charging the homeowners um, for these retrofits, and then not achieving the result. So, radon was still at dangerously high levels to the occupant's health. And so that is why these standards were implemented to ensure that the contractors um, were indeed bringing 
the rate on levels down to that national level or that national standard, um, public health standard, that the measurement professionals were performing measurements correctly into national standards, and then that the laboratories that the measurement professionals were um, relying upon were also implementing per both um, uh, professional standards, but also uh, uh, national standards. Senator Goggin, follow-up. Uh, yeah, follow-up. I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Durenberger, um, if this is rulemaking is transferred to the Department of Labor, what would you do differently than what the Department of Health has done? And as uh, Ms. Fontaine stated uh, out of Chapter 15, it does, uh, statute does provide for uh, the transfer of rulemaking. So I, I guess I'd like to know what would be different uh, with the Department of Labor uh, having this uh, rulemaking and licensing ability versus what uh, MDH has currently. Mr. Durenberger. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Senator Goggin. Um, well, I don't know that we would do anything differently, but the bill as it's written requires us to do rulemaking. Uh, so we would still have to go through that rulemaking process. Uh, if, if, in fact, we do have to, we'll, we'll have the same rules that are in place now with MDH, we would, we would continue to uh, administer those, but we would still have to go through a new rulemaking process that's clear in the bill. And I, I can't predict what the outcome of that rulemaking process would be. Follow-up, Senator Goggin. Uh, last question, if I could, Mr. Chair. When... When the departments do rulemaking and licensing and that, do you benchmark other states uh, and see what they're doing? And, I, and the question, the other question I have is, uh, how many other states have their Department of Health administering the licensing for radon testing? Uh, Mr. Huff, can you take that one? Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Senator, there are 17 other states um, that have similar um, requirements. Um, when we do rulemaking, we always look at best practices and look at what other um, states have done. Um, the uh, um, states that are structured like we are um, have either um, this requirement in the environmental control agency, so for example, our PCA, or in the health agency. There are some states, just a couple states, that have sort of a combined overarching regulatory agency um, where the regulation is not divided up among, among different agencies. So for those that are structured similarly, um, it is either in the uh, uh, environmental or pollution control agency or the health agency. All right, uh, Senator McEwen. Thank you. I just had some closing comments real quick with this. Is that it, may I do that now, Mr. Chair? Yeah, I believe we're done with questions. So yes, go ahead, Senator McEwen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I thank you very much for, for bringing this bill. And I'm, I'm really, you know, I have a lot of questions about it. I appreciate the, the desire to see more efficiencies. And I think, of course, if there are room for efficiencies in the way that we do the do things, we should pursue um, those and see what we can do. But my concern here is that it, both of these agencies are are not on board for this, at least as it as it's written right now. And um, I just wish maybe some maybe some more had been done on the front end to work with agencies to see if this was actually possible um, to do in a way that that they would be on board with. Um, so under the the current way that things are are looking, I'm going to have to um, not be able to support this bill at this time. But it's not necessarily because of the efficiencies issue. That's very I'm very sympathetic to that. But I I am concerned that that perhaps there's a focus more on um, the economic efficiencies rather than on the critical public health aspects of this. And of course, our agencies have to put that first and foremost. Um, and um, so I'm going to have to vote against this bill at this point. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, uh, Senator Draheim, I want to thank you for bringing this fo bill forward. Um, I think you 
stated it at the beginning, but I'll reiterate, um, or maybe it was uh, Mr. Erickson who stated it, but contractors have a relationship with the Department of Labor. They work well with the Department of Labor. They typically do not have much of a relationship with the Department of Health, and I think that has been a complaint all along by a number of contractors that they don't get the service from the Department of Health that they do from the Department of Labor. And that was probably, if I recall right, one of the big reasons this bill came forward in the first place. Um, and I think as far as the agencies being opposed to this is from what I believe we've gotten here today, a lot of their opposition is just flat wrong. The idea that rulemaking would go away was wrong. The idea that they have to start all over is wrong. Um, so I, I, I'm gonna be happy to support your bill today and move it where the rulemaking piece can be dealt more with at the state government level, that's where it belongs. Um, but uh, so Senator sure, Trayheim, sure. I will give you closing comments. Well, I, I appreciate your, your thoughts and, and members for the questions. I, I, you know, I think I could work with nonpartisan and address the rulemaking piece um, in, in state government. And, um, you know, th this is just about efficiency and uh, construction is so important right now. We are short 50,000 housing units and we need to do everything we can to help that whole industry move forward. Um, this isn't a, a gotcha bill. Um, it really doesn't change the function of what's being done. It just shifts it from one agency to another that deals in, in this industry. So thank you for your time, members. Thank you, Senator Dreheim. And with that, I will renew my motion uh, that Senate File 295 be passed and referred to state government. Uh, we will take the roll. Mrs. Johnson. Chair Rarick. Yes. Senator Dornick. Senator Goggin. Yes. Senator Isaacson. No. Senator McEwen. No. There being three ayes and two nays, the bill is passed and referred to state government. Thank, Thank you, Senator Dre. Thank you, members. Our next bill up is uh, Senate File 1547, and we have Senator Pratt with us to do this bill. And I will move Senate file 1547 to pass and be referred to jobs and economic growth. Uh, with that, Senator Pratt. You just get this set up. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chair and members. I hope this is going to be a, a fairly easy bill to pass through. Uh, Senate, and, and I'm presenting this on behalf of uh, Senator Jasinski, but uh, Senate file uh, 1570. Uh, 1547 uh, simply directs the Department of Labor to, re to do a review of current benefits, the adequacy of current benefits for injured uh, police officers. Uh, this started, uh, I started on this bill shortly after uh, Miss Wolf's uh, husband, Dan, uh, was injured uh, as a Minneapolis Bomb Squad member. Um, and she'll testify about uh, what this means to her family, but uh, it was also highlighted uh, with the uh, uh, the injuries suffered by uh, Officer Madsen. And then it also requires uh, the uh, pensions to uh, be a part of this discussion and this evaluation as well. Uh, Mr. Chair, I believe we have a gap in how we support uh, our injured police officers at the, uh, who are hurt on the job and um, that's, uh, I'll leave it at that for now and, and would be happy to answer any questions. All right, thank you, Senator Pratt. I do believe we have an author's amendment, a one amendment to change some of the dates being this was introduced last year. So I would move the a one amendment. Um, this is an author's amendment. So all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, the amendment passes. Uh, Senator Pratt, anything further from you? All right, uh, Ms. Wolf, would you uh, identify yourself for the record and begin your testimony? Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Wendy Wolf, and my husband Dan was the commander of the bomb squad for the Minneapolis Police Department when he was injured by a blast in 2005. 
we thought at that point that we had prepared for any eventuality. He had a very dangerous job, obviously. But we thought that the work comp system and the pension system would take care of him if he was injured or killed. And we found out that there's a hole in the system. It's a systemic problem with the interaction between workers' compensation and pension law, where if you are permanently totally disabled in the line of duty before you reach normal retirement age, so people who have a severe life-changing injury early on in their career, you get the least support of any injured workers. There's a, a provision that says after two years, the city or your employer's liability for wage loss under work comp law is limited to $25,000. And then after that, um, you have an offset of your wage loss that your pension takes away from your wage loss 100%. They, they don't get combined to what you used to make. You start with what the wage loss benefit is, and if your pension is equal to that or more, you get just your pension, and the employer doesn't have to pay any wage loss benefits. When I brought this to the attention of the, the Pension Commission in 2008, uh, they did uh, uh, consider making a fix for everybody, decided that it was too complex of an issue to do without a study. So the executive director of PARA agreed to do a study, and in the interim, as a stopgap measure, they increased my husband's pension from 60% of what he was making to 75%, with the idea that they would come back with the study and do a broader fix for this problem. And the, the executive director of PARA found that there was a whole lot going on right after that with the collapse of the economy, so they put off doing the study and eventually just decided not to do the study. It's my understanding that both pension and the Department of Labor and Industry are willing to do the study now, but they need to be directed to do so by the legislature. This systemic problem is catastrophic. Even with the increase that was given to my husband, his pension currently, he's 57 years old. His pension is half what his pension would have been had he made it to the end of his career and retired healthy. When he was hurt way back in 2005 as a young officer, he, was, he had a standing offer to go work at the FBI bomb school down in Alabama. So he could have worked his career, gotten a full pension, which is double what his current pension is, and then had another career at the bomb school in Alabama. He was highly regarded nationally and internationally for his work. But as far as state law is concerned, he is basically a waste of money. And the same thing is happening now to Eric Matson. They are in the thick of, you know, the, the part where you're sort of in shock and just trying to get through the day. But I've spoken with them, and they're concerned about falling through this same hole as well. This was put in place in 1993. It happens maybe once or twice a year. There's been other changes that make the hole even worse than it was in 2008, where if you make it to the end of your career and are catastrophically injured, you get both work comp, wage loss, and your pension. Pensions have now been capped at a 1% increase, so you fall farther and farther behind every year. And they took away survivor benefits when you turned 55. So when my husband turned 55, his pension went down by 10% in order to protect me having survivor benefits because the pension commission assumed that the spouse has their own income and their own retirement and they don't need the survivor benefits. But my husband's injury took away my ability to earn a living. Before he got hurt, I was making $50 an hour as a, as a web designer. I now make $30 a day as a caregiver. The system is broken. But until this study happens, it's not going to get fixed. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wolf. Um, our next testifier is uh, Mr. Ethan Landy with the Department of Labor and Industry. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. Uh, for the record, my name is Ethan Landy. 
I'm here from the Department of Labor and Industries Office of General Counsel, and I am here today to provide comments on Senate File 1547, which is a bill relating to police disability units that requires DLI to study the adequacy of benefits for disabled or injured police officers. First, I'd like to note that uh, the Legislative Commission on Pensions and Retirements heard this bill at its meeting on February 8th and laid it over for possible inclusion in the pension omnibus bill. DLI provided testimony at the Commission's February 8th meeting to go along with the Commission's summary and materials. And those materials were included with the materials provided for today's uh, meeting and they provide a good background on some of the issues and complications involved with this study. I'd like to speak specifically to the fiscal notes. Uh, DLI put together a fiscal note last March on this bill that was included with your materials. Uh, I'd like to briefly discuss some of the background and assumptions from that fiscal note, uh, which suggests that completing the study would require working with a consultant and also cooperation from other groups, including PARA, MSRS, and the Pension Commission. Okay. Mr. Landy? Yes. Uh, this will be going to jobs where the fiscal note uh, will be discussed. We're, we're the policy uh, committee here. So um, we, I'll let you touch on it some, but we don't need to get into too many details. Uh, that will be done in the jobs committee. OK. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I do think that some of the fiscal note Reasoning does go into the policy, though. So I, I won't get into the fiscal part. I'm just more talking about the background assumptions behind it. So, but please, if I get into that point, you, you know, feel free to direct me. Thank you for that. Um, just to note that DLI did suggest working with that consultant because DLI lacks the familiarity on this entire subject matter to perform this study, um, as the request does not involve just workers' compensation, but as noted, also the adequacy of, adequacy of disability and pension benefits. Disability and pension benefits include PARA and MSRS. Uh, the proposed bill does not specify how to measure the adequacy of benefits, and so our idea was that the consultant would likely need to review and compare programs from other states and analyze benefit scenarios and the impact. Uh, the note did summarize that DLI would need to compile data, and I just want to go a little bit into the background of that data. DLI has limited data on this issue, um, but we would need to verify and add to any data on permanent total disability or PTD. Um, we would need to coordinate that with PARA, MSRS, and potentially other groups and sources. Um, so DLI would still need to pull the data for the study uh, based on the current workers' comp law and interaction with pension and disability benefits um, due to the statute, which is Minnesota Statute Section 176101, Subdivision 4, that does reduce permanent total disability benefits when an injured employee is also receiving government disability benefits due to the same injury or injuries. Um, in 2019, DLI estimated that this would involve about 33 claims, but that data gathering process that would be involved with this does involve a manual aspect, um, and it, we would need to determine how far back to go for that study. Um, there's a small number of claims in that regard, but the interaction of benefits would need to be studied in depth, um, and there's not probably going to be a large pool to gather conclusions and draw conclusions from for that data. Um, this would involve multiple units at the department. Just to be clear, the, the work would be primarily done in pulling the data by our research and statistics unit. Um, due to the complexity of the law and the interaction, um, it would also require work by DLI's Office of General Counsel as well as the Compliance Records and Training Unit, um, which is our primary work comp compliance unit, um, to gather the claim information. Um, and so I'm available for any questions on the proposed bill, um, including questions that might be uh, here for the potential impact of what the study might find, but um, try and keep it high level about what uh, DLI would do and the policy behind that um, for, 
performing the study and just want to reiterate in summary that um, the if directed to do this study, DLI could take that on, but it does require um, cooperation from other um, areas, particularly para, MSRS, and the uh, Legislative uh, Pension Commission. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Landy. And, and yes, uh, like you said, well, we did hear this in pensions, and I think the overwhelming agreement there was that uh, this is something we need to do for our law enforcement officers. Um, and I know there's been a lot of discussion around who should be doing this. Um, there are so many different entities involved, and I guess the uh, Department of Labor was picked um, to kind of be the focal point and to bring in others. And that's why this will be going on to jobs, because we do understand there will be a, a cost uh, to hire consultants and to bring in other agencies. But uh, I think this is something we owe um, our law enforcement uh, folks who get injured on the job. So um, are there any other comments or questions? Uh, Senator McEwen. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for um, bringing this bill. This seems like a, a good idea. I'm, I'm wondering, and, and thank you so much for sharing um, your testimony today. Um, I, I, it was very moving. And I, I'm, my question goes to um, whether or not um, this would apply more broadly to other workers in Minnesota because the, the description of the problem that I'm hearing is sort of the interplay between someone having um, been found to be permanently totally disabled um, at a very young or before their retirement age who is receiving um, retirement benefits through PARA and that interplay and that perhaps um, you know, it begs a larger question, is what I'm wondering. Are, are, are the benefits in a case like this overall um, for other workers sufficient? And is there, a, is there a, a problem with it overall? So I'm wondering about just the, the scope of this. I understand that, the, of course, there's a desire to want to take care of uh, police officers, but I'm wondering if this problem is... Um, I'm wondering about the scope of this problem. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Sen thank you Senator McEwen. Um, you know, as this is written, it is just uh, specifically for uh, law enforcement, but uh, I believe it would be something that could be uh, semi-translatable to other um, pensions as well, and things that could be looked at once this is done for other uh, workers. But uh, as written, this is specifically for law enforcement. Any follow-up? Yes, Mr. Chair, thank you. I, I have read the bill. I'm familiar. I know that it, that it does only apply to police officers. I guess my question is for um, DLI or for the, the author. I'm wondering if there is um, about the scope of the problem that they're talking about. Thank you. Uh, Pratt. Mr. Chair, Senator McEwen, um, it's it's only the the injured police officers have have come to me about this this idea. I have not heard from the others. So you know we could certainly you know if if that's an issue we can we could reach out to to see if those benefits need to be uh, expanded as well. I think there's a an inherent risk to the the first responders. Uh, you know as we as we heard, uh, you know Dan Wolf was injured when he was 39 or 40 years old. 40. And uh, you know that's a that's a long time for some of these these uh, uh, claims to be sitting out there. I would also mention, Mr. Chair, that this was reviewed by the Work Comp Advisory Committee back in 2019, and uh, the group did not object to the study. They didn't they didn't feel at that time that it needed to be expanded, uh, nor did they uh, have any reservations about moving forward. Thank you. Any follow up, Senator McEwen? All right, Senator Mr. Goddard. Chair. Oh. We'll start with Senator Goggin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Thank you, Senator Pratt, for uh, bringing this bill forward. And Mrs. Wolf, thank you so much for all you're doing to take care of your husband. And thank you for his service. A, uh, uh, this needs to be resolved. This has taken way too long. Um, the question I do have, though, is uh, 
I was going to ask about other other areas, the first responders, possibly National Guard, uh, but I think this is one where um, we get this template down uh, going forward for the uh, uh, law enforcement. But one one question is 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 will this include PTSD uh, review? Uh, because in the last couple of years we've seen a large number of increases in PTSD uh, claims within our law enforcement agencies across the state. So I just want to make sure that uh, we are uh, going to do a, a good study and, and include uh, the PTSD as well. So. Is Senator Pratt any, or maybe Mr. Landy would be a good one to ask that question to? I think Ms. Wolf would like to comment on this piece of it as well. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so most of the people who retire with PTSD are not permanently totally disabled. PTSD is treatable and um, even in really tough cases, people can generally get another job that's not so stressful. The, the people that are impacted by this hole in the system are people who can't do any job and usually can't live independently either. And I can speak to the veterans part of things also because my husband and I are both veterans and we're familiar with the military disability system. Minnesota's system is fundamentally different from the military disability system in that in the military, if you're unable to work at all, you're automatically considered 100% disabled in terms of benefits. So the state allows you to have uh, a significant deduction on your homeowner's insurance, you get a pension and, and uh, they also pay your caregiver to take care of you and you get basically free nursing home care for the rest of your life. For people who are disabled in the work comp system, you can have as small of a percentage of disability for the permanent partial disability, it can be as low as 13%. So there, you, you've done a good job of protecting employers from having to pay benefits, but not a good job of taking care of the people who are really, really hurt. My husband's case on the permanent partial disability side has never been settled. It's been 17 years since he got hurt, and it's still open because... Courage Center said my husband's life was worth $240,000 and the city of Minneapolis said my husband's life is worth $9,000. It's the, the system is really messed up when it comes to severely injured people and police are unique in that because they're, they don't have an expectation of safety in their job. They have to go forward whether it's safe or not. My husband was injured in training and he was following every safety rule that was put in place by the federal government as far as explosive breaching was concerned, but the rules were wrong. And when we tried to let people know that this was inherently dangerous and people needed to change their tactics, OSHA refused to do a safety study. They said it wasn't necessary. So we were fighting individually trying to let people know that this was not safe. When you look at people like uh, carpenters or other you know, construction workers, they have a private pension so if, if they're a union carpenter, so if they fall off a roof or whatever and end up in the same condition that my husband is in, they get their full pension from their union. Their social security might offset, but they also get wage loss. So this is something that uniquely affects public safety people. And I've been lobbying about, um, on this since 2008 by myself. If it was a big problem for everybody else, they might have wanted to jump in on this, but I have not had anybody come and help me on this effort. The people who are impacted by it are struggling to survive, and it's embarrassing to tell people that you've been financially destroyed. They just lick their wounds and go hide in their homes, and they don't talk about it. And police that are healthy don't know that this hole exists. Like I said, we didn't know about it. I started telling people, and people didn't believe me at first. Now they believe me but there are people who admire the problem and want to keep stretching it out and not fixing it. So we, it, this is a very unique issue in our state right now. Senator Goggin, any follow-up? 
Mr. Landy, was that you trying to get my attention earlier? It was, Mr. Chair, and I apologize for that. I just had thought that uh, there was some additional background to Senator McEwen's earlier question. Um, and also Senator Goggins' questions I could try to provide a little bit of background on, and um, if I may. Yes, go ahead. All right, thank you. Um, I was mentioned, first of all, um, that this has been heard a, a couple years ago by the Work Comp Advisory Council, and I just wanted to clarify that that piece there. Um, the Work Comp Advisory Council, as, uh, as I believe the committee members know, hears changes uh, primarily for workers' compensation that are related to Chapter 176. Uh, when the council heard this issue in 2019, the members uh, felt that it did not directly impact Chapter 176, so they did not need to do a vote on it. Uh, the members said that if it was a um, issue that the department was willing to do, you know, it was the department, if the par department was willing to uh, engage in the study, that was more a department than the council. So I want to um, also note that at that time, however, there were members, and I believe this goes to Senator McEwen's question, uh, of the labor side of the um, Workers' Comp Advisory Council that did have questions about the scope of the study. Um, and the scope being just limited to police officers and whether there were other um, occupations that would be impacted. And I think the answer to that question is the law is not limited to police officers. And I think that's, that's the, the clear. So, but as, as noted, the study is limited to that. So the study right now, as noted earlier, as I said, 33 members was the estimate in 2019. It might be more. Um, and to Senator Goggin's point about that and the PTSD, that could potentially um, impact if there are cases. I, I would have to check with our um, research and statistics team as to what those numbers would be like. Um, and then that would be a question of what the scope is of the study itself, um, how far it goes back, and, and um, what information is available. Thank you very much. Um, I do not see any other questions or comments. Um, Senator Pratt, final comments. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and uh, thank you for the discussion, members. I think we all understand the importance of this, as Ms. Wolf said. Um, these men and women are putting on a badge and putting their lives in, on the line every single day. And when one of these first responders is injured on the job, uh, we owe it to them and their family for the dignity and respect uh, not to suffer as, as a, a financial hardship uh, as, as Dan Wolf's family has. And so members, I would uh, ask you to vote in favor of the bill. Uh, I think the discussion here has been good and um, uh, we'll address the financial or the, I'm sorry, the fiscal note uh, in the in the jobs uh, and work and uh, economic growth committee, uh, Mr. Chair, of what you sit on. Thank you very much. And with that, I will renew my motion that uh, Senate File 1547, as amended, be passed and re-referred to the Jobs and Economic Growth Committee. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion passes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members. All right, next we have Senate File 2698, Senator Swadzinski. Senator McEwen, would you like to move Senate File 2698 for us? Um, sure, I, I would. I would be happy to do that. Right. Um, I don't know necessarily. We'll just, I apologize. I was not prepared for yeah. this. this no, we'll just, we'll just uh, as long as I have your yes, I'll say Senator McEwen uh, moves to have Senate file 2698 uh, before the committee. <laughs> Indeed, I do. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Swadzinski uh, to Senate file 2698. Thank you, Chair Rarick and members. Appreciate this opportunity. The bill before you today is Senate File 2698. Before we begin, I'd like to offer the A1 amendment. Um, 
Senator Swadzinski, we'll have uh, Senator McEwen uh, move your author's amendment as well. Okay. Senator McEwen, do you wish to move the A1 author's amendment? Yes, I do. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And members, uh, this is an author's amendment. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The amendment is added. Senator Swadzinski. Thank you. Mr. Um, Chair Rarick and members. Th um, the bill before you as amended would require sports stadiums um, to provide uh, uh, one foot of netting or shelf jutting out from the upper decks to catch objects that may fall down upon people sitting in the area below. The idea was brought to my attention back in October from a constituent of mine. Um, our jobs as legislators, one of them um, uh, is, I think, to, you know, to listen to our um, constituents and when they have concerns, and the previous testifier is a classic example of that, and so is my, the, uh, my constituent to my left. And uh, um, so he he um, had a bobblehead hit him at, in the head at a Twins game from the area up above. And um, as any citizen, um, d um, Mr. Johnson came to brought this, his incident to my attention and, um, and just want some other Minnesotans to never go through what he had to go through. And the idea, as I said earlier, is to provide some kind of a safety netting or a, or a structure that would jut out so that accidents will happen and bobblehead bo dolls and baseball bats falling from um, the ledge down to the sit setting down below. And so we put this legislation together, and over the last couple days, there's been a, a lot of stakeholders have come forward with a lot of further ideas, um, people from the Timberwolves and the Loons and the Wild and the Vikings and the Twins and all these other advocates and stakeholders um, want this to, 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 to move forward, and but they have a lot of ideas on to make it even a better bill. And... Um, and, and the Department of Labor and Industry have, has been brought to my attention. Um, some of the issues that they would like to weigh in on, and I believe they're maybe going to be here today. And so, uh, as with everything, the former teacher and me would always say, um, "Let's um, gather some information here and um, do the best thing for the people." And so, anyways, with that said, um, Chair Rarick, I'd like to introduce the, my testifier, um, Doug Johnson, to the um, committee. Uh, Mr. Johnson, please identify yourself for the record and uh, begin your testimony. Uh, Doug Johnson. Uh, thank you, Senator. Um, and it was a, a Twins game back at the end of September. Uh, my wife and I had got a couple tickets at a uh, foundation dinner, and they happened to be in the Delta Sky Club, which is behind home plate. I'd never been in that section before. And uh, we, it was a nice... September evening, so we got down there a little bit early so we could get something to eat and get in our seats. And it also happened to be the game that they were retiring Justin Morneau's jersey, and they were giving out Justin Morneau bobbleheads. And our seats were behind home plate, but quite a ways up right in front of the press box, the, the last row right by the press box. And we had sat down in our seats. We had just got something to eat, and the next thing I know, something hit me on the head, and it felt like a chunk of the ceiling cement had fallen. And I played a little bit of professional hockey, and I've been hit many times in the head, and I don't know if I've been hit as hard as what this hit me in the head. And I was half knocked out, half unconscious, and I guess when I finally came to and got to my senses, I put my hand up, and there was quite a bit of blood on my head, and um, thank goodness there were some good fans around us. One happened to be a doctor who came to my aid, and all we had was a napkin, <laughs> and that didn't last very long. And then he said to me, um, I've, I've got a lot of blood on my hands, the doctor's hands. And I felt, well, maybe he thought he was going to infect my cut, and he was more, well, you could infect me of what you might have. And now, you know. I'm kind of feeling bad, and so, so anyway, we're assuming it came from the suite above, which is, and again, I'm speculating 30, 40 feet up, it hit me in the head, and it, you know, created a lot of blood in my sweatshirt and my pants, and we ended up not staying for any of the game, and afterwards, I just got to think, we don't really want this to happen to anybody else is what happened. And, and if there's a simple solution that you go to a sporting event that you're not going to be hit 
by something in the head. And, and everybody's been, you know, there's, there's pop that comes down and beer and spilled and those types of things. But, you know, having a bobblehead hit you on the head. And, um, and, and now with today's college and professional game, there are no paper tickets anymore. And virtually everybody's required to bring a cell phone to get in the venues. And those are probably a little bit heavier, some of them, than bobbleheads are. So if you're going to, you know, and people get excited at games and they jump up and, you know, whatever, you know, that if those things start falling on a regular basis that, you know, there could be quite a few more injuries. And that's when I talked to the senator to say maybe there's a simple solution of adding some netting, <clears throat> some additional plexiglass. So if something does kind of fall over or you're sitting it on a, a ledge that it, it catches it and doesn't come down. So that's kind of the reason I'm here, just to you know make sure venues are a safe and enjoyable experience for the fans that go to games. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, next up, we have Mr. Dave Horsman um, with the with the ballpark operations for the Minnesota Twins. Mr. Horsman, please uh, identify yourself for the record and uh, begin your testimony. Uh, my name is Dave Horsman. Uh, I am the uh, Vice President of Ballpark Operations for the Minnesota Twins. Uh, by way of background, I've been with the Twins in a full-time role for the last 27 years. Um, before that, for about five years, I worked part-time uh, at Twins games and other Metrodome events, beginning as an usher when I was in high school. Um, all of that time spent with the Twins has been in stadium operations, event operations, security, and guest services. Uh, I appreciate Mr. Johnson's testimony today um, regarding this really very unfortunate situation that he, uh, that he experienced. Um, you know, we're in the event business, right? And, and our goal is to create great experiences for people. And um, you know, hearing about negative situations like this, it really does give us an opportunity to look at how we operate. Uh, and, th and try to think about ways that we can improve our processes so that, uh, uh, so that situations in the future are better. So I, I do appreciate uh, Mr. Johnson sharing his uh, experience with us, and I, and I am sorry that that, that, that happened. Um, I am uh, to, here today to speak in opposition of this bill. Um, the, the bill before the committee today is, in my opinion, uh, it's, it's problematic. Um, the type of incidents, incident that Mr. Johnson experienced uh, where a solid item falls from one deck down below, it's really very rare. Now, as Mr. Johnson alluded to, we do have situations where somebody on the, say on the upper level spills some popcorn and a gust of wind blows it over the edge, drifts down on people, or someone spills a beverage on a drink rail and it runs down the wall and drips on people below. Those sorts of things do happen, although those aren't, uh, aren't terribly frequent either. But solid items falling from one deck to the, to the next, I, I can think of maybe a handful of situations over the years that that, uh, that, that has happened. So it's a very rare occurrence. Um, when you think about what this bill would call for, um, it requires significant engineering and design, um, a lot of material procurement, fabrication is because there's, uh, to my knowledge, there's nothing out there on the market you can just buy off the shelf. And it'd be a very complicated installation on a, on a very large scale for a, for a facility such as ours. Um, this would uh, require pretty significant capital investment. And in my view, this really represents a logistically difficult and cost prohibitive um, reaction to what, to what really is an isolated incident. Um, you know, said another way, this, the requirements in this bill would really be, a, uh, in my view, a disproportionate response to the incident that, um, that precipitated it. Um, there are numerous other potential ramifications. I'll give you just a, a couple of examples of what, of what we could be looking at. Now, in a, any system like this would really have to be installed on the facing of the uh, upper levels of, the, except, uh, of the, the facilities in question. And in most of these facilities, there's already infrastructure there. Um, you know, for example, at Target Field, such an installation would require us to remove or at least significantly alter hundreds of linear feet of digital video board uh, our closed captioning boards, um, more than a dozen static ad panels, all would have to be either removed or, or significantly altered. Now, the video boards provide a key element to our game experience that 
that, frankly, our customers have come to expect. Our captioning board, removing the captioning boards would have a, uh, uh, would challenge our ability to ensure that our stadium and our events are accessible to all fans. And the removal of the uh, fixed ad panels, along with the digital video boards, would have a negative impact on, on revenue. You know, additionally, it's, it does seem likely, as I think about how this installation might happen, um, that installing such a system may very well have sightline issues for some of the seats in the first couple of rows and some of the upper levels. If people come to Twins games, right, they want the best seats in the house. To be honest, I can't afford the best seats in the house, right? So, you know, you come to a game, you want the best seats that you can, uh, best seats you can get in the price range that you can afford. And there's a real potential that such a system like this might impact the sight lines on some of those very seats. Um, those are just a couple of examples of what, uh, of what, what could happen. Um, when all this is taken into consideration, um, the requirements called for in this bill w would really represent a significant burden that's really not proportionate to the issue that uh, it means to resolve. And as a result, I'd, uh, I'd encourage all members of this committee to not support advancing this bill. Uh, Mr. Chair, committee members, um, thank you again for allowing me to speak today. Thank you for your testimony. Um, next, we have Mr. Scott McCown from the Department of Labor and Industry. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chair and committee members. My name is Scott McCown. I'm an assistant director of construction codes and licensing, a division of labor and industry. Thank you for the opportunity this morning to testify on Senate File 2698, uh, Stadium Safety Nets. The department is unaware that this has been an issue nationally, as this type of requirement is not in the national codes that Minnesota, Minnesota adopts. However, if this is to be carried forward into Minnesota law, there are many details that must be addressed to ensure owners and designers understand what is being required. For example, does the bill regulate both existing and new facilities? If the bill will regulate both, what would be the effective date for existing facilities to be brought into compliance? Retrofitting existing facilities would be challenging and costly. Although another item would be, what is the weighted and netting designed to support? It makes a difference if it's paper cups, baseballs, phones, or people. Architects need to know the strength and the design capacity of the netting, the size of the openings that would be permitted in the netting, and if there's a maintenance provisions, for example. Putting technical requirements in statute is not desirable as changes that technology and products can quickly make them obsolete. The agency prefer prefers the process of evaluating codes and engaging stakeholders under the umbrella of the Construction Codes Advisory Council. If the bill moves forward, language could be drafted in statute that allows for the agency to engage in the rulemaking process to put the specifics into the state building code. Thank you for this opportunity and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Uh, Senator Swadzinski, any uh, more comments before we go to questions? No, thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, any questions? Senator Goggin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, <clears throat> Senator Swadzinski, on your uh, amendment, you have a uh, shelf for netting that extends at least one foot horizontally out from the seating tier. Should there be any requirement for a vertical length as well? The reason I ask this is uh, back in my younger days, I worked security at Mile High Stadium. And uh, even with the, I think we had 10 or 12 foot high chain link fences, people were still able to get things over the top of it. Uh, and I almost got hit by a beer bottle at, at, that, at one of the games. So I guess my question is, is, should this have a vertical requirement as well as the horizontal? And will, and then secondly, is one foot enough or is it five feet, 10 feet, 20 feet out? I, I don't know. I'm just trying to get a, a, an idea of what a netting system like this would look like. And uh, as Mr. McCown said, you know, there's gonna be a lot of engineering involved in that and they need to know what the, uh, weight limits or weight requirements are for uh, the netting and that. So I'm just curious what your thoughts are on that. Senator Swadzinski. Um, thank you, um, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Goggin, for that. So I'm glad you didn't get hit with the bottle. Um, and um, so the thinking was a, a, a vertical or right vertical netting would be more of an obstruction. And, you know, people that want to be malicious will always have 
you know, be able to throw something over a netting. But we were thinking that this would just be for the accidental person that has their bobblehead or their baseball bat or their cell phone sitting on the ledge. And as they jump up in excitement over some, you know, thing they just witnessed that they accidentally push their um, thing down below and it tumbles down and hits somebody on the head so that the netting, it wouldn't cause an obstructive view because it would only be out this far from the actual. Um, so that's where our heads are at. But this is a work in progress and um, we just want people to be safe and it's, it's, it's a good thing to, to feel safe when you're at a sporting event. So, but that was our thinking. Right. Follow-up, Senator Coggin? No. Uh, Senator McEwen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Chair, I actually just had a question for you. Um, I'm wondering what your intent is with this bill. Uh, I'd thank, lay it over. Yeah, thank you, Senator McEwen. Yeah, I spoke with Senator Swadzinski. There are some things he's working on on the bill yet. Uh, you'll notice there are some blank uh, parts in the bill. So we are going to be laying it over and allowing him to continue to work on the bill. Senator McEwen. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I, I really appreciate the intent of this bill, and um, I look forward to seeing where it goes. Thanks. Any other questions? Senator Dornick. Well done. I know you've been working on that. <laughs> I think everybody that I've met with, no, no one's like gung-ho, this is except for injured people um, that have been injured at sporting events. Uh, if, I, if I did suggest that, I, I misspoke. Um, I shouldn't have said that. But, they, but everybody I've met with is very optimistic. I mean, very, um, how would you describe um, yesterday's meeting? Very cordial, open very to respectful. Open to discussion. Open to discussion. I've been very pleased, pleasantly surprised with how open to discussion all the stakeholders have been through this process. So. Senator Dornick. Um, I was told yesterday the answer is no by somebody in our, was it? Uh, yeah, Mr. Chair, Senator, uh, that's correct. There is, there's nothing like this that's been implemented uh, across Major League Baseball, across any sporting uh, uh, facility in the U.S. that I'm aware of, nor in North America. Uh, I'm not aware of, of, of any, uh, any such installation in any sports venue. Can I make a comment? And Senator Swadzinski, I guess. The one of the blanks in the bill is the occupancy. Um, what is that? Uh, can you speak to us about that? Part uh, yeah, of one of the stakeholders going? yesterday said, well, um, what about the Orpheum? What about the State, the State Theater? What about the Ordway? And those, these are all things, as with how, you know, how a bill becomes a law, 101, we're working through. We just want people to be safe and to not be harmed at sporting events. And, and, and we have the opportunity here to be first. Um, in the nation and have the other 49 states look to us um, with this great idea that um, we've kept people safe because I'm sure um, <coughs> Mr. Johnson's not the only person that's been harmed. Um, my testifier would like to say something. Is that appropriate, Chair? Thank yes, you. Yes, Mr. Johnson. Yeah, just when I did some research on this and maybe the gentleman who had spoken earlier that the building codes, stadiums are built to certain building codes, minimum building codes, but you could add to those codes. And I don't have any facts on it, but I've seen the Dallas Cowboys play in their stadium. And they had a little higher plexiglass up and out in front of the upper decks. You know, just a little out maybe a foot and up a foot. But again, I don't know, you know, factually, I can just know what I saw on television on those that maybe some venues have taken more precautions than others. All right, I do not see any other questions from members. Uh, Senator Swadzinski, any closing comments? No, thank you again, Chair, for hearing this, and um, let's try to make um, what Mr. Johnson went through not happen ever again. All right, uh, thank you very much, and with that, we will uh,
lay Senate file 2690 or hold it over for possible inclusion and let the author continue to work on it. Um, there is no other business before the committee. So with that, we are adjourned. Thank you.